around. And uh, welcome to the April 5th meeting of the Santa Cruz County Regional Transportation uh, Commission. Could we start with a roll call? Commissioner Rodkin. Here. Commissioner Bator. Here. Commissioner Virginia Johnson. Here. Commissioner Leopold. Here. Commissioner Mulhern. Here. Commissioner Schifrin. Here. Commissioner Caput. Here. Commissioner Kaufman Gomez. Present. Commissioner Johnson. Here. Commissioner Brown. Here. Commissioner Bertrand. Here. And Commissioner Lowe. Here. All righty. Uh, before we start today's uh, meeting, I want to uh, just recognize a longtime member of our uh, uh, bicycle commission uh, who recently passed. Uh, Kem Acall was a Live Oak resident uh, who served on our bicycle committee um, uh, maybe close to 20 years. Uh, he served both uh, in District 1 and District 4. He, would, he was a longtime advocate uh, for cyclists. Uh, he was never shy about sharing his point of view. Uh, he, was, he was tireless, though, in his advocacy for sports, recreational opportunities, and for good bicycle planning. Um, he, he, he really uh, cared uh, to make sure these opportunities were available uh, not only for people like him, uh, and he was a triathlete, but also to make sure it was available for everyone in the community. So if you could just join me in a moment of silence uh, for Kem Acall, who recently passed away. Thank you. So now we'll start with oral communications. This is an opportunity to address the board about issues under the purview of the Regional Transportation Commission, but not on today's agenda. You'll have three minutes. Um, and uh, a yellow light will come on when you have one minute left, and uh, then that red uh, to stop. Uh, good morning. Uh, good morning. Uh, uh, my name is Jack Carroll. This is the first time I've spoken to the RTC. I'd like to compliment your website. It's uh, easy to navigate and has uh, all the information needed uh, accessible. Thank you. Um, the, when our community uh, debates uh, whether uh, rail should be part of the rail trail corridor, um, the uh, traffic congestion on Highway 1 is inevitably part of the conversation. Um, the uh, 2015 rail feasibility study um, had uh, some statistics about uh, uh, daily boardings. Uh, I think the maximum was 6,800. Um, it's uh, hard for me to uh, correlate that with um, a reduction in Highway 1 um, uh, peak traffic congestion. Um, does that number represent a 50% reduction in um, uh, highway traffic or just a 5% reduction or some other number? Um, the, um, I think there's a great importance uh, as to just how much of a reduction in Highway 1 traffic the uh, uh, rail component of the plan would uh, generate. It um, uh, was a, a major item in the 2015 uh, online uh, survey. Uh, the public was very interested in that. And um, the feasibility study talks about spending as much as $500 million over a 20-year period uh, to provide the uh, rail portion of this. So um, I ask uh, you, um, is there any statistic or any estimate as to how much uh, Highway 1 peak traffic congestion is going to be reduced if we spend $500 million. 
this, uh, during oral communication is your chance to address the commission. It's not a chance for a dialogue. It's th uh, this item is not on the agenda tonight, so you can share your your uh, perspective on it. But we won't be um, we won't be engaging in a dialogue about it. So. Okay. Um, Brown Act requires you not to take action, but it doesn't supersede your First Amendment right to speak to me. But uh, that's your personal choices. Um, just let me say that uh, the corridor study that's coming up ought to address, uh, ought, ought to address the uh, uh, traffic reduction that we can expect, because I don't think anybody in this room thinks that 100% uh, of the uh, traffic is going to be eliminated. And uh, we should know what uh, the uh, benefits of the uh, $500 million investment is to the people that won't actually be getting on a train. So thank you very much. Thank you. Good morning, Becky Steinbrunner, resident of Aptos, and I just want to make it clear what the gentleman just said. The Brown Act does allow your commission to have brief dialogue with members of the public to encourage public input, and uh, there are three actions that your commission can take when there is public input not on the agenda items, and one is to have brief discussion with the member of the public for clarification. You can refer them to staff to get answers or help, or a member of your commission can put the item on a future agenda for public discussion. So under the Brown Act, you can respond. And that is done to encourage public input. I am here this morning to, uh, to discuss with you um, a recent encroachment within the um, rail right-of-way in the Aptos Village area. Um, a construction trailer of Testorf construction was moved into the rail right-of-way just inches away from the track and parked. Um, I did contact uh, Ms. Christensen from the RTC and asked about it. She assured me there was a right of entry agreement with the APTA, with Mr. Testorf, not other developers. Um, but when I asked for a copy of the document, I've still not received it. I've filed a Public Records Act request to receive it and have been told by Ms. Um, Yesenia Prara that I will not be able to see it until May 31st. I have a lot of concern about this and I also want to know about the impending Parade Street crossing over the railroad tracks in this area. Um, supervisor Friend has, in writing, accused me of uh, stating I'm taking legal action against this. That is not true. I am not taking legal action. But there could be legal action regarding the matter from the owners of the Bayview Hotel and Trout Gulch Crossing who own the property under the tracks in the area in front of their businesses and the plan to accommodate the Aptos Village project developers for the new Parade Street crossing is to close the private at grade crossing in front of the Bayview Hotel Trout Gulch businesses. This is uh, illegal. It is inverse condemnation. Not the county, not the developers are talking with these property owners about compensation for closure of their, uh, their private crossing the effects on their commercial value to lose their street front access to the public. No one is talking, so I am not talking about legal action, but there is discussion about legal action, and I encourage you all to look into it. I also want to say that um, the phase one uh, project of the Aptos Village Traffic Improvements, which your commission has funded with uh, $1.4 million, maybe uh, more. I'm being told that the three minutes is up. I guess our light. Oh, there's no working. timer here, so I don't I, know. I apologize. Uh, uh, this is not a, uh, our, although I sit here re regularly, the staff on the RTC doesn't you sit here regularly, so. I'm sorry. Uh, we apologize. Uh, for Do I have to stop? If, is that what you're saying? I just want to uh, conclude your remarks. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much for the warning, and if you can put the timer on, that would be helpful. Um, I just want to say yep. the phase one is nearly complete. It's been over a year to take that. There is no public notice for any of that work that caused one hour delays going through the village. 
last Friday. Well, there are I, no I, I markings to, for uh, phase. Steinbrenner, I just wanted you to comp uh, c okay. c conclude. Markings your for there. phase two are on the road. There's absolutely no public notice at all, and your bo your commission funded that part, 1.9 million dollars. Thank, Thank you. you. And I apologize for the, the for the uh, clock not being on. Okay. We're going to try and get it fixed. Okay. okay. Thank you. We will try to give a, a better warning when the, you're getting closer to three minutes. All right. Um, hello, my name is Diana Panyawa, and I am a student from Watsonville High School. So for this year, as a senior, our, we had to do a CAP project, which is a community action project, and we decided to team up with the Friends of the Rail Trail. I didn't know there was going to be a train transporting from Watsonville all the way up to Santa Cruz and hopefully to Davenport. And after doing a lot of research, we've come to learn that we may be connected to Monterey and maybe even one day go all the way to San Francisco. Being a teenager, we don't have that much freedom in Watsonville because you were just stuck there. So I want you guys to know that for the youth and the future of our youth, please have this train happen. We need something that connects us to Santa Cruz, something that connects us to Aptos, and I myself has, have taken the bus. It takes an hour and 30 minutes to get to Santa Cruz without traffic. It's a very long time. I don't think anyone has a time for that. And I want you guys to know that the youth needs this train and we need it for just us, for the youth. So don't forget the youth. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning. Good morning, <coughs> good, good morning commissioners. Uh, just a general overall statement. Uh, Michael Saint with uh, Campaign for Sustainable Transportation and uh, I'm stuck in Aptos basically. She's stuck in Watsonville. Um, Basically, all I wanted to talk about is a little frustration going on with my personal outlook on a lot of these policies throughout all our counties. Uh, seems to be a disconnect between what we're trying to do. Um, we have environmental needs versus economics, and then we have the politics on top of that. Um, uh, the best thing going on so far is Monterey Bay community power, and they basically have gone 100% uh, greenhouse emission free greenhouse gases which is awesome, and thanks to Jenny and Mr. McPherson for starting all of that. Um, then we get down to the Regional Transportation Commission, and we're throwing out a project on widening the highway, which is going to increase, increase greenhouse gas emissions. And then I just attended the Board of Supervisors meeting in Monterey, um, in that county, and that was kind of somewhat depressing. Um, they just overturned an appeal, or the appeal by Trio Petroleum to put four exploratory wells in. So I see some people doing good, I see some people counteracting that, and eventually this Trio Petroleum, if they do find oil, their objective is to basically start another San Ardo, San Ardo oil field down there. So there goes the greenhouse gas things that uh, Monterey Bay Community Power is trying to prevent. Um, frustrating. And we also talk about sustainability in a lot of areas. Uh, I just want to leave you with one definition, and this is by the um, female prime minister, ex-prime minister of Norway, and I don't know if you've heard of her, uh, Gro Harlem Brundtland, and she was basically the mother of sustainable development. And as we go through all these processes, maybe keep in mind that her definition of sustainable development is meeting the demands of the present generation. One minute left. Yep. Thank you while preserving the rights of future generations to meet their own needs. So as we go through all these little three minute drills and also the policies, that would be something good to keep in mind. And I'll see you on item 22, thank you. Thank you. Hi, Gail McNulty, Greenway. Um, first of all, I would like to just quickly commend all of you for your endurance. I know that these meetings are often quite long and we never know exactly how long they'll be. With that in mind, I know that the closed session topic is later, but just in case anyone is here in the audience today that has concerns about progressive rail, I'd like them to just raise their hands now in case, because we might lose some people by the end of the meeting. So 
Yeah, Thank I, you. No, I appreciate that, but we're not going <laughs> to. I know we're not going into that now. So. Um, and I would like to just piggyback on what Mike just said um, about meeting the needs of the current generation. And I'd also like to commend the Watsonville High School students that are here today to speak out for young people, and specifically young people in South County um, who are needing and expecting change now. When we passed Measure D, um, it might have been a lot of things. Yes, it is to fix potholes, and yes, it is all of those things. But the ad campaign was get people moving, right? It was get Santa Cruz County moving, and it had these beautiful images of active transportation in all of the advertising. It's disingenuous to sit here and allow the public to think that we are going to make changes when those changes aren't going to happen for 20 or 30 years. So I would just like to recommend realistic solutions. We'll go into more later. Thank you. Thank you. All right, we will, we will, uh, I will let you know when you have uh, uh, one minute left. Great. Good morning, commissioners. Uh, the Sentinel was good enough to print my letter to you, so I'll just go ahead and read it. Uh, our last rail operator pulled out because they couldn't make ends meet. Uh, applicant Progressive Rail will try something well, different. Excuse me, if you're going to talk about Progressive Rail, this is on the agenda, and there will be times uh, to talk about the closed session items at the end of the agenda before closed session. Ah, okay, and so will that be around 10.30? Uh, the the yeah. sooner we get done with oral communications, the sooner we will get to the rest of the agenda. All right, thank you. So if you're here to speak about Progressive Rail, that is on the closed session agenda, you'll get a ch chance to speak to us before we go into closed session. Good morning, everybody. My name is uh, Matthew Zender. This is the first time I've uh, spoken here. I just wanted to share my opinion on the rail trail and the greenway. And um, I'm a resident here in Santa Cruz. I was born here, and both my parents uh, live here and they're teachers. Um, I do live on Portola, right across the street from Jade Street Park. And um, I just have a concern about where the um, actual uh, loading um, or the boarding, I guess you could say, of the trail, proposed rail trail would be. And um, I can just remember when we did have a train that went through Capitola and the Pleasure Point area with the uh, San Lorenzo lumber stop. And I just remembered how close that was in proximity to the houses with the train. One of my friends lived off 38th and Portola and uh, it was like extremely close. And I just wanted to share my thoughts on the Greenway and um, <clears throat> just how awesome it could be potentially to have a place for uh, people to ride their bike and walk in a peaceful, beautiful trail that um, I hopefully look forward to seeing happen. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning. Uh, I'm Barry Scott. I live in Aptos. And uh, just a couple of things. It, it's interesting that um, a lot of folks talk about traffic congestion on Highway 1 and, and, and then refer to the uh, 2015 feasibility study. I, I, I don't know that reduction in highway traffic and congestion is even possible, much less the objective of, of alternatives to it. Is the goal of rail transportation to decrease traffic on, on Highway 1? I don't know. I think, I think the, the goal of rail transit or alternatives to transit active transportation, sidewalks, bike lanes, and so forth, is to just be out of the traffic, to give people a choice not to be in it at all. So uh, I'd like to, I'd like to you know, point that out when we hear uh, claims about reductions in traffic. And in fact, when we hear any claims about uh, that go back to the 2015 study, that is already a dated document with old information. There was no Pajaro station uh, on the, you know, about to be built at that time. There weren't electric uh, trains available that could run on batteries. Um, I want to share uh, that I, I spoke with Monterey Bay Community Power yesterday to make sure that the renewable energy component would apply to uh, customers who are commercial, industrial, and agricultural, and it would. And what I'm saying is that uh, these electric trains that we might be able to deploy would be 100% renewably powered. And finally, in our 2018 Caltrans state rail plan, if things work out, they're, they're explicit about shifting from highway to railway. They're talking about multiplying the mode share for rail by a factor of 20 from, I think it's uh, 0.34 percent of trips on, on trains to 6.8. That's a multiple of 20. And that's all. Thanks. Thank you. Good morning. Good morning. 
Um, my name is Kathy Marino. I'd like to thank you for your due diligence that you've been applying to finding out the right way to use the rail trail. Um, I'd like to urge you to preserve the rail because it's an invaluable easement and valuable corridor that we are gonna find out that we'll have, if we give it up now, we may not even be able to build a trail. Let's put it that way. If we don't have rail service on it and we don't have the rails, some of the land will be returned to the original parcels that deeded the easement. Um, and let's see, there's no reason we can't do the rail trail, I'm sorry, I'm nervous, and, and build a trail and, and keep the possibility of rail. My family's been here since 1860. We're still scattered throughout the county. I worked for 25 years as a senior electric estimating engineer for a large utility, relocating utilities. I know how much it's gonna cost if we have to widen the highway, if we're gonna have to widen the major thoroughfares, and I think we would be throwing away a lot of taxpayer money by giving up the rail. I think we should keep it for a future option, and thank you. Thank you. Good morning. Good morning, everybody. Thank you for the work you do. It's very difficult. My name is Jeremy. I'm one of your local emergency physicians. I think it's fair to say that everybody in the room is deeply concerned and uh, troubled by the traffic on Highway 1. That seems to be the main focus. Certainly, I've driven it lately, and it's uh, frankly unbearable. When I, when I go past the trail and I think about the possibility of us using it both for bicycle and the possibility of rail in the future, I think that's a brilliant idea, and I think very few people are opposed to that. But it seems that we have the possibility right now to turn it into a bicycle friendly, a more usable daily trail, while keeping in mind the long term possibilities of eventually adding rail to it. And I just want to encourage the commission to think about that possibility that within a year or two, logistically speaking, we could have that as a possibility using it on a day to day basis, while simultaneously undertaking the upgrades and the advancements necessary to do rail there in the future. However, for the shorter term possibility, I think it's unlikely considering all the logistics we have to undertake here with the upgrades necessary, with the money necessary, with the amount of time this is actually gonna take for us to delay the project only until it's rail. Why not use it in the meantime for shorter purposes? And if somebody can show me a plan where five years from now, 10 years from now, we can have logistically speaking an actual rare process, then let's move forward. But in the meantime, every time I go over those tracks and I think about the ability to bike on it with my kids, and it's just sitting there not getting utilized. I could literally get on a bike in Aptos and bike to Santa Cruz safely, cleanly, efficiently. Why can't we have that within the next year or two? And I appreciate the consideration for it for the future. Thank you. Yeah, using the suggestion from a, a member of the public, we will start construction on the trail uh, in the city of Santa Cruz uh, later this year, Watsonville uh, the year after, and on the North Coast uh, maybe the year after that. So we will. Uh, have under construction or construction in the next five years, 25% of the length of the, of the trail. Good morning, I'm Brett Garrett. I'll be very quick. I often speak in favor of personal rapid transit, which I see as the way to meet the requests from the transit side of the community and from the trail side of the community to, um, to just reach a, the best of both worlds for everyone. I just want to encourage you to please keep an eye on Clearwater, Florida. There's been a couple of news reports this week about Beach Tran, and Beach Tran is um, building a, they're hoping to build a personal rapid transit system. It will be all funded by private investors, so there's no cost to the county in Florida to build this system. Um, Santa Cruz County could do something similar where we get private investors to build this system. Um, we could have a wonderful transit system with no cost to the community and there could be some kind of agreement where it transitions into public ownership later. I'm not aware of them doing that in Florida, but I mean, I, I always think public transit should be public, but there's an advantage to getting it built however we can do it. Thank you very much. Keep an eye on Beach Tran. Good morning. Good morning. I'm Karina McFarlane. I live in Live Oak. Um, I just want to say that we cycle everywhere. We're total intrepid urban cyclists. I know some of you are. Uh, we have a quadriplegic friend who's come in for an extended stay, and I'm right now building a manual wheelchair bicycle tandem so that we will not have to go into car, and she agrees with me, <laughs> the whole time that she's here. Um, that's not the easiest thing to do if you've got a heavier person, and so we're also doing a GoFundMe for a battery-assisted tandem wheelchair bicycle, which is 
very expensive, like 9,000 bucks. But the point I want to make is I've never been battery assisted and we avoid the escarpment on the steepest places. We live in Live Oak, we go over Arona Gulch. When I've got kids on my bicycle, I'll go around on the trestle over San Lorenzo River to avoid the steepest. So I'm really for rail banking and keeping that as a transit corridor for bicycles and new transit. I'd love to see the IBM Watson local motors Ollie running from Watsonville to Aptos on and off the tracks and all the way, all around, everywhere, fast, way faster than a metro bus. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning. Good morning. Gary Lindstrom from Aptos. Um, I also agree that um, I think that the rail trail in combination is a great idea. Um, I'm a person that likes to think out of the box and try to come up with new ways to move people around. Um, I do watch a lot of uh, programs on uh, PBS and things about transportation problems around the world. And I think that what we need to do on this uh, rail part of the rail trail is truly think outside of the box. I know that we are required uh, because of the millions of dollars that have been given to us uh, to develop this system that we have to be able to carry freight. But nobody says that the freight has to be at the weight that it is now. It can be transported smaller quantities of weight. And I'm proposing that uh, we think about monorail uh, electric rail, the elevated, they do through elevation with electric, or uh, a gondola type uh, transportation system. The gondolas could be very low slung. They'd be able to transport any number of people. The gondola decides the number of people that go on it. It's totally quiet. It can be run solar. And uh, if you need to run transportation, then let's come up and design a car for the system that can take smaller loads of whatever it is that we have to transport. Uh, it may be a little more time consuming, but we would meet the, the requirements of the federal government. Uh, I live along the tracks. I do not want to hear those tracks going hour after hour. We didn't mind it for years. I've lived in Aptos for 53 years, and for 43 years of that, I've lived along the uh, uh, railroad tracks. So, you know, going by once in the morning and then once in the afternoon was great. We could run all the kids out there and they could wave and have a good time. But that noise going back and forth, back and forth, whether it's electric or uh, diesel or whatever system they're gonna use, You've got metal against metal, and it's gonna make a lot of noise. It's very heavy, and I just think that we really need to think outside of the box. Santa Cruz has always been open to new ideas and trying to be creative, and I just think that uh, something like a monorail or um, an elevation system or the gondola. Gondola is being used in Portland now. So it's, it's a very easy, system to work and uh, very, very inexpensive to operate. Thank, Thank you. you. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, my name's Tom Hay. I live in Live Oak area. I've come to several of these meetings and I know you've heard just about everything. I can imagine your positions like, oh my God, here's another guy. Well, here's the deal. Um, I live in a senior park with 100 and 20 residents there and we discussed this subject about how to use that corridor and um, and how's the money going to be spent in town and the folks there you know as you get older maybe you don't want to drive anymore it's harder to get around etc we'd really like to see more smaller a bus system like a uh, rubber wheels you know like smaller system that can come by closer to where you actually live um, so it'd be easier to get around that way and a lot of people in the park are now using uber and they use Lyft, things like that, because they're cheaper. You get to work just right to where you want to go. Now, also, we also see a vision for the future of having that corridor, having it a very wide trail used by 
you know, children going back and forth to school, a way to, for them to get downtown, or all of this, all, everybody, but we're talking about kids a lot, because they're gonna be the ones that are gonna use that trail. Who's gonna use that, and how are they gonna use it? Well, they're very active, it's an outdoor sort of sportsy community here, and we think of that kind of like what's ecologically the best thing to do here. And we would like to be able to see that path. We can ride, people can ride bikes. There's a lot of electric bikes now. We see that that could be a real tourist attraction where people would come from all over to use that trail to get through Santa Cruz to Davenport, even down, even down to Monterey. If you see across the country different trails, different rails have been changed over to a trail, they become very popular uh, tourist attractions. I can see having electric bike rentals along that trail, you know, coffee shops, food places. But this way you can just hop off at any, any intersection you want on your bike, whereas a train you can't do that. You're stuck in that car and that's it. You're, you're stuck. What are you doing there? You can hardly see the town. You kind of whiz by, you know, fences behind people's homes. So we're hoping that we can uh, make a safe alternative to what we have now, which is congested streets where you really don't want to get on a bicycle to go out there. We have a real high rate of accidents out there. Um, and we want our kids off the streets on a safe corridor where we feel good about them being out there. It's their future. We're all going to be probably out of here by then. And so we need to give them what they'll want in the future. Stay healthy, get outside, and, uh, you know, I think get the picture, right? Okay, thank you. Thank you. I've got something to address you on that is uh, not progressive rail. Okay. Um, Manu Koenig, Santa Cruz. Uh, first, I wanted to address uh, Mr. Leopold's point that we're building 25% of the trail uh, in the next year or two. Um, a tr it's not a complete trail unless it's a complete trail, right? I mean, I think about the Greenway as an opportunity very much like the highway, right? So I commuted for many years from Coralitos, and I thought about my commute like this, 10 minutes to get out of the Redwoods, 10 minutes to get to the freeway, and 10 minutes on the freeway, 15 to 20 with traffic. And so I think about the Greenway very much the same. If I can get my bike to the Greenway within 10 minutes, then I can probably get anywhere else in the county within another 15 if I have an electric bike. And so Alta study actually recently did a uh, Alta recently did a, a study that showed if we have an intermittent trail, it will be treated as numerous small trails, not a continuous one. So, it, we and we could expect a decrease in ridership of at least 43 percent. So unless we're talking about the right plan, which is a continuous bike trail that uses every single bridge then we're not talking about the same thing. You can't have both. It's not the same trail unless you use the entire right-of-way. I, I also wanted to address Mr. Scott's point that the numbers from the 2015 uh, Rail Transit Feasibility Study are somehow obsolete. I reread that study the other night. And it's incredible, you know, the amount of work that went into that, looking at origin destination data from AMBAG from all over uh, the county, counting for the fact that we have students in this county, that we have tourists, uh, and that that would somehow increase the, transport or the use of the train even beyond what we see on BART. How is this somehow all of a sudden irrelevant? You know, I've done a lot of outreach in Watsonville, and uh, I ask people every time, I ask them to sign the Greenway petition, uh, could you take a train? And many of them say, yeah, no, I can't, okay? Because they're taking a truck, right, to either do deliveries or because they're doing service work, they're, uh, you know, whether it's construction or landscaping. A lot of the service, uh, a lot of them have jobs within Watsonville itself or a lot of them are going beyond Watsonville to San Jose or uh, maybe they're going south. And so, once again, I, I think that was probably captured in the origin destination data. So. I don't think it's irrelevant at all, and I think if you go talk to constituents, you'll see it proved out. One last thing. Yes, the highway is broken, but that doesn't mean we should give up on it and that we can't fix it. If you look at London, if you look at Singapore, if you look at Milan, they've all implemented something called congestion pricing. It costs like actually 10 pounds to get into central London during peak hours. It costs you three euros to get into central Stockholm during peak hours. Now, the idea of toll lanes is abhorrent, but it could fund transit and it would encourage people to carpool better than any carpool system we could devise. Thank, Thank you. you. Is there anyone else who wants to address us during oral communication? 
seeing none, I'll return to our agenda. Uh, are there any additions or deletions to the, today's agenda? Um, yes, Mr. Chairman. Uh, we have uh, a replacement page for item 13, and we have uh, some additional correspondence uh, for the closed session, item number 26. Okay, thank you very much. So now we move on to the consent agenda. Uh, I look to my colleagues if there's any items they'd like to pool or comment on on today's consent agenda. Uh, uh, Ms. Gomez. Just be sworn in as the commissioner before I can take this vote? No, we don't, we don't, we don't, okay. we don't swear sure. people in here. Well, I, uh, because I have been on the other commissions, that's why I was just Yeah, sure. you're appointed. You're okay. appointed. All right, good. We got the letter. <laughs> <laughs> Dear John, thank you. Um, is there anyone in the audience who would like to comment or pull an item off the consent agenda? I just had a clarification for the minutes, and I'm sorry, I, is this the time to do yes, that? sure. Okay. Um, in the minutes, it states that I had uh, concerns about the impacts of freight travel uh, with Progressive in the county. That's not actually what I said. I said I wondered what uh, customers Progressive Rail said they were courting already for freight traffic in the area. I was at the presentation and they said that, and my, what I said at the meeting last time was that I had concerns about what type of freight they might uh, bring into the county considering their, uh, quote, gem of a, a project in the Midwest has to do with fracking supplies. That's what I said, and I'd like it corrected. Thank you. All right. Um, good morning. Good morning. Good morning, Eduardo Montesino, representing the uh, uh, bus operators um, for Santa Cruz Metro and uh, paratransit folks. Um, just wanted to uh, I just highlight one um, one letter of support for Senator Monning's bill of as. Um, SB 1236, um, and just want to report that uh, currently at Santa Cruz Metro, we already go above and beyond that. So you know, great, uh, great in supporting that. Thank you. Thank you, and thank you for your ongoing work to move people around the community. Second. I changed the wording in the minutes to say type of concern about the type of rail of a freight service rather than saying about freight. Let me just say, there's a motion on the table. Is there a second? I seconded it. Okay. Motion by Rockin, seconded by Schifrin. Uh, Mr. Bertrand. Well, I'm just to add some, add some comments to the um, agenda. Uh, uh, March the 3rd of the um, Santa Cruz Regional Transportation Commission Budget Administration Commission meeting. Um, I made some comments there that weren't captured in the meeting minutes. And the comments on what item are you oh, talking what, about, which, please? Yeah. This is on the consent, right? <coughs> well, number the, the, there isn't the March third. Uh, oh, the, there's a March eighth meeting what I'm talking about. draft minutes. Yeah, six one. Yeah, yeah. I made so some continue. comments to uh, put on future agendas to review the amount of money we put in special funds for emergencies. Okay, so uh, I just uh, want that captured. That's all. Um, I'm just trying to figure out where that was in the minutes so we can get a, a clear direction so we can um, have that refract. Ref, uh, so it's item 6-1 and it's the budget committee. I know, but on that, on that agenda, you was, know, there, was there a... We were discussing the uh, budget approval and, you know, I was noting the amount of money that we actually put for emergency funds and, you know, based on our experience in Capitola, we revised that to increase that, and um, we're very glad we did. And so I brought that up. Uh, George concurred that it would be a good idea to have that review. Yeah. And I just want that captured. Uh, what item were we talking uh, about? Uh, the, we this comments. is item six. Uh, I, I think maybe it, if I was looking at the uh, the minutes, is that item seven, amendments to the fiscal year uh, 1718 budget work program. Oh, I'm program. sorry. Yes. Okay. That's yep. or, the, or the number eight, which is the 2018 19 proposed right. budget. I, I think he's to, uh, you're talking about item number six, which were the minutes of the Budget and Administration Committee meeting. No, no. That, yeah, that. 
And that's, you're saying the minutes don't accurately reflect all Correct. of your comments. You, you were sitting next to me. So and you, you would you like the minutes. That, yeah. yeah, I'm just trying to figure out what part of the minutes, the, what on, item on, on, I know it's item six on today's agenda, right. but within the, the, uh, that uh, minutes, is there a particular? Would be item eight for the, yeah. the next year's agenda. Oh, um, uh, I was just pointing out budget. that, um, yeah. um, Ed just pointed out to me, I did miss that, and it's actually an item eight. Yeah. I missed that, so my, my and, apologies and to the board. it says here that, uh, it says that the RTC, d that the RTC directs staff to conduct a study of the appropriate percentage of RTC reserves. Is that not reflective yes, of what you said? Yes, that is. I, I did skip over that sentence, Okay. And that's so there's problem. not a, so there's not a change? Not a change. Okay. It's been captured. So Thank we you. have a mo, we have a, <laughs> there's a, <laughs> So we have a motion on the floor from, uh, from uh, Commissioner Rockin, seconded by Schifrin, uh, to uh, uh, accept the consent agenda with the one change in the minutes by Ms. Ms. Steinbrenner uh, to accurately reflect her remarks. Uh, is there any more discussion? Seeing none, all in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion carries unanimously. And with that, we move uh, to the regular agenda. Our first item on the regular agenda is Commissioner Reports. This is a chance for commissioners uh, to report on items. Uh, uh, Mr. Badaroff. Yeah, I just want to inform uh, the public that uh, uh, during the month of March, uh, myself and Commissioner Dondero went back to Lakeville, Minnesota for four days, the week of the 18th to the 21st, to uh, interview and meet with Progressive Railway. During that time period, we uh, went to uh, three states in three days and viewed three different operations Progressive owns approximately seven short track railways. Uh, we visited Progressive Rail in Lakeville, Minnesota, Wisconsin Northern Railroad in Norma, Wisconsin, and Iowa Traction Railway in Mason City, Iowa. And the purpose of this visit and tour was for us to do our due diligence and interview this operator, to use some criteria to judge you know, their effectiveness of performance and evaluate their company. And it was. Uh, I would say a successful uh, trip on our part, although it was 17 degrees and a little different than what we're used to here in California. But um, we uh, did a, a very a concise evaluation of what they did. They showed us all assets of their business and uh, had us meet with uh, their banker. That We met with the mayor of uh, Lakeville. Uh, we met with uh, some economic development people in different counties, uh, clients, customers of Pro Progressive Railway and pretty much uh, three days of a broad spectrum of, of how Progressive runs their business, their impact on the community, and what they would be like to be a potential operator in this county. Thank you. I'm sure that'll be helpful for us. Are there any other commissioner reports? Uh, commissioner Johnson. So uh, on that subject, did you meet with any of the people who were opposed to Progressive Rail, who talked about some of the adverse effects that they had on their community? I would say not. I, the, the biggest perspective we had is when we met with the mayor of Lakeville, who obviously had had public hearings about people that, that came, and he shared some of the concerns that had been brought up by the, the members of the community. But as far as actually talking to members, we did not. I thought that would have been useful to, to, to kind of get a perspective of, of what some of the problems were there and to get it firsthand instead of secondhand, say, from a, a, a mayor. Yeah, I, I, will add that, I will add that when we did talk to the mayor, uh, there was a, um, I believe, a, either a, a, a tweet or a, um, a, a, a program in Lakeville which someone had created, and it was actually a neighbor in a residential track where the mayor lived. And he brought up those tweets, and we looked at the, the comments from the individual, and we asked about, you know, how long ago was this? Uh, and are the, is it still active concerns and complaints? And he did share with us that although there were some concerns initially that uh, was down to where one person, one or two comments, and not an ongoing situation. But the mayor was very candid about uh, uh, you know, the, the information he shared with us. Thank you. Um, seeing no other com uh, comments or commissioner reports, uh, move on to our executive director, Ms. Don uh, Mr. Donero. Good morning. Uh, Good morning, commissioners. Um, I have a, a quick report on uh, progress on the Unified Corridor Study. Um, our uh, consultant uh, has uh, a sub-consultant uh, working on the economic piece of this project. Uh, 
the subconsultant is Strategic Economics from the Bay Area. Um, they have been meeting with RTC staff and with the economic development and planning folks from uh, departments in Watsonville, Capitola, City of Santa Cruz, and County of Santa Cruz um, to gather information, um, looking at existing and potential future economic activity uh, within the project area uh, was discussed. Um, and uh, the information they collected will be used to determine potential relative economic benefits associated with the transportation projects and various different scenarios that are being evaluated in step two of the scenario analysis. So, um, and the other item, I, 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 I won't repeat any of, of what uh, Commissioner Bator said, but I would say that the, the trip to uh, Minnesota was uh, to look at, I think we got a very good look at progressive rail and their impacts on the community. And um, I think that uh, we got to see that they're a very dynamic company. Um, I think they deliver what they promise. We saw evidence of that wherever we went and that they invest in uh, communities that they serve, uh, helping local businesses uh, um, flourish. So, and we also met with some of their employees and they all seem very happy. It seems like their employees are treated well and they have a, um, profit sharing plan for all their employees. So just to add those things. Great. That's all I have. Thank you very much. Um, and then we'll move on to item 20, which is the Caltrans report. Good morning, Ms. Lowe. Good morning, Mr. Chair, commissioners. Well, April is the month when we put a special spotlight on safety. And one of the things that we do is uh, we honor the uh, 188 uh, Caltrans workers who have been killed on the job. Uh, on April 26th, there will be a memorial um, honoring those folks on the west steps of the Capitol. We also hold a similar worker memorial at our offices um, in District 5. Safety is our top priority and we're always looking uh, at the um, innovations and new equipment available to keep our highway workers safe. But we also, of course, ask and rely on all of all of us uh, users of the system to take special care when we're uh, driving through work zones or uh, in the proximity of maintenance work areas. Uh, I would uh, just say that normally we don't have anything going on above us on the top <laughs> floor here, the no, county building, but here. they are uh, putting uh, solar panels and other installations <laughs> on <Excellent>. top <laughs> of us. Right. So uh, that's a good thing, that's but good thing. Uh, today it might make some noise. I apologize right. for that. <laughs> that's progress, all right. Uh, with the departure of our uh, director, uh, Malcolm Doherty, earlier this year, uh, you may have heard that after seven years, he's moved on to um, opportunities in the private <coughs> sector, and he's with a, working with a firm on their strategic uh, management. Uh, Lori Berman, who came from District 11, is now our director. Uh, she comes with about 30 years of experience with Caltrans and a variety of responsibilities, and is highly respected. She'll do a great job leading our organization. In the meantime, uh, she has asked our, our District 5 Director, Tim Gubbins, to hold the fort while they uh, permanently fill the position down there in District 12. He will be back. He has told us he'll be back. But, in the, and, and, but then, of course, these dominoes. In the meantime, now Richard Rosales, who's the, uh, otherwise the Deputy Director for our um, Project Program Management, is our acting district director. So you may see him from time to time. We're expecting um, all of these things to be in place sometime this summer, hopefully early summer is the hope. And then also in this time of change, we're getting ready and working hard to deliver on the commitments and all the new investments that SB1 provides. And we are also hiring. And I know you, you might think if you're driving around, you think Caltrans is lots of people in orange shirts and, and hard hats. That's true. We have a very large maintenance force. Uh, we're always looking to add uh, people to our maintenance forces. But we also have careers in uh, engineering, of course, environmental planning, transportation planning, legal services, administration, uh, e equipment operators, uh, in, um, IT, information technology, and last but not least, uh, right of way and surveys. And we're looking to fill a myriad of positions in all of those professions. So as you uh, advise uh, friends, family, uh, folks uh, around, uh, Caltrans is a great place to work. So please consider that. And there's a lot of information available online. 
Thank you very much. Are there questions uh, for our representative from Caltrans? Sure. Oh, uh, uh, Commissioner Caput. Uh, thank you uh, for your report. And uh, on uh, <clears throat> page 20-4, item uh, number 9 and 10, uh, they uh, are they pretty much shovel ready? There, I know that uh, it's for the spring. It says of 2018. So, uh, is there any update on how the bidding's going and whether or not uh, they're actually going to start? This is a this is about as shovel ready as we get. I don't have the um, information available here. It looks like we're still getting ready to advertise number nine. Uh, and I don't know that we've advertised number 10 yet. Okay. But we will be sure we keep you informed on, on that progress. And the funding for safe routes to schools and everything, uh, that there's still funds and we're ready to go on certain projects? Uh, certain projects have uh, safe routes to schools funding. That's uh, largely um, county projects, local projects. Uh, in the kind of moving forward, the Safe Routes to School funding has been rolled into the Active Transportation Program. And the CTC will be announcing another cycle of ATP coming up in May. Uh, but all of the projects that we've spoke of previously uh, with those funding, that those are represented here. If you're speaking directly of the, the Watsonville projects. But more opportunities will be forthcoming. Uh, so when uh, somebody makes a... Uh an appeal to uh, have actual funding near a specific school. Uh, what, what's the timeline, uh, basically, on what, when, it, when it's actually decided to either go ahead and do the project or not do the project? Uh, well, Commissioner Caput, it really depends on the project. Um, but uh, funding allocations under the Active Transportation Program are very uh, strict. I believe there's a, um, a four-year cycle for those. Okay, thank you. Are there other questions for our Caltrans representative? I would just uh, offer my uh, thanks uh, to you for uh, a small safety project that we talked about last time um, uh, with, some, uh, with some new paint. Uh, people feel a lot safer on Highway 17, so thank you for doing that. Um, next, we'll move on to our next item. The Please come forward. Thank you, Becky Steinbrenner, resident of Aptos. Um, I have questions about, um, because it is safety awareness, the Aptos Creek Bridge um, on Soquel Drive and Spreckles was last year inspected routinely by Caltrans civil engineer, Mr. Zulke. And um, it took a while for me to get that report. I just got it last week. And um, this is a 90-year-old historic bridge. It is showing severe cracking on the um, barrier walls. And that was noted in the report, but there is no um, recommendation for any repair or remediation. Um, I had asked previously for a load limit to be placed on this bridge. And um, the report refers to 1979 load summaries that were not um, actually addressed in the report, but um, they're available and I've had to file a Public Records Act request to get them. That material is on its way, thankfully, to Mr. Um, uh, Shivers. He's great to work with. Um, so my concern for safety is the Aptos Creek Bridge, and I, I appreciate that Caltrans inspects it routinely every two years. Um, the RTC did a traffic study at that point, Spreckles and SoCal, and determined in 2016 the traffic count was 16,600 cars a day with 10% um, truck traffic. That percent of truck traffic has vastly increased with the Aptos Village project construction and um, associated road repairs on Valencia and SoCal Drive in the area. Um, I have seen some days concrete trucks and loaded uh, double tractor trailers of soil go over that bridge every 10 minutes, all day long. So I'm concerned about the safety of the Aptos Creek Bridge. 
and I want to thank you again for inspecting it and would urge Caltrans to make some recommendations to the county. The second uh, thing that I would like to ask you about that I have referred to in previous meetings is the safety aspects of the State Park Drive Highway 1 interchange. Uh, Commissioner Friend has told me that the dangerous condition near that at Sea Ridge and State Park is a Caltrans issue. There are many people that live in that area and it is a very hazardous crossing. I would really like to see a center turn lane put in that area to improve the safety of the State Park Highway 1 interchange for residents in the Sea Cliff area. Thank you very much. Thank you. Next, we'll move on to item number 21, which is the on-call engineering services for the Santa Cruz Branch Rail Corridor. Good morning, Ms. Christensen. Good morning. I'm Sarah Christensen, Senior Transportation Engineer, RTC South. So today I'm here to um, request approval of a list of on-call engineers. Uh, this is the first time that the RTC has had on-call engineers. It's really exciting. Uh, we have a lot of work to do on our right-of-way. Um, and also for authorization for the first set of task orders. In February, we released a request for qualifications for experienced and qualified engineering consultants uh, to submit statements of qualifications uh, for three categories civil engineering, structural engineering and inspections, and construction management. Um, the purpose of having on-call engineers is to support the RTC staff with inspections of the infrastructure and the various improvements that are needed along the rail corridor. A total of 11 statements of qualifications were received, three for civil engineering, three for structural engineering, and five for construction management. The selection committee reviewed the, the statements of qualifications. Uh, the selection committee consisted of three senior engineers, one from the county of Santa Cruz, one from the city of Santa Cruz, and myself. Um, attachment one of my staff report includes the list of the selected consultants for the three categories. And just to note, the specific scopes of work um, will be negotiated on a task order basis. So this is just a list of qualified consultants that we could then negotiate um, specific task orders with. Um, it does not guarantee a specific dollar amount to be contracted with any of the um, consultants. And the contract period for the on-call um, consultants will be 36 months. <coughs> <clears throat> the first, basically the initial effort uh, for the on-call engineers uh, will be to help us with inspections of the bridges and the infrastructure, uh, which we're asking for authorization for $500,000 to help with that effort. We have sufficient funds in the Santa Cruz Branch Rail Line budget under the Railroad Structures Inspections Analysis and Rehabilitation task. So with that, um, I'm here to ask answer any questions that you guys have. Thank you. Other questions? Mr. Johnson. Thank you, Chair. So help me understand rail pros. What do they do? Rail pros, um, they are a railroad-specific um, engineering firm. They do a vast, um, a lot of different types of work, including structures, uh, construction management, civil engineering. Um, and we included them because um, they were one of the only ones who really did specifically rail uh, type of work. And so we feel that, you know, we might need their expertise in the future. So, I'm, so with the Unified Corridor Study coming forward um, and, uh, and everything kind of being, <clears throat> excuse me, put off until that study is completed, um, is it wise to put in dollars before that study is completed with respect to all these um, uh, engineering studies that might go on to help promote uh, a rail system? So just to clarify, the majority 
is going towards structure inspection and regardless of what the use of the structures are, we still need to maintain those bridges and uh, make sure that they're structurally sound. So that so you'll study the structures, you'll, you'll, the, the trestles, uh, do a, uh, and this is yes. more or less a Capitola question, I guess, and I'll leave it up to uh, Commissioner Betron uh, to ask it, but they have a, a trestle that is in distress. Would that be the type of thing that this uh, uh, list of engineers would study? Yes, so they'll be um, inspecting every bridge within the rail uh, right of way. Uh, there's 32 of them. And they'll also be doing uh, load rating analysis for that as well, for each bridge. All right, thank you. Sure. Other questions, Mr. Bertrand. So uh, you skipped, did, did you want? You can go ahead. Okay. Oh, I didn't so uh, Commissioner Johnson, thank you for bringing up um, Capitol's concerns. Um, so Capitol's had several meetings with uh, your staff on this issue, George and Luis, and we're very concerned about the fact that the capital structure uh, goes over an area where people live. Um, it was also noted in some of those meetings that the inspection was um, actually in arrears. It should have been done last year. A fall time frame was suggested, but it wasn't actually defined. So this inspection has um, been waiting. So my concern is, of the people chosen as experts, it was mentioned in one of our meetings that um, the RTC would like to keep the same inspectors because they have a record with this particular facility um, and probably all the other trestles in the rural corridor. So was that uh, inspector facility or company chosen? Um, so Biggs Cardosa was one of the structural um, engineering consultants yes. that was selected and they have um, a lot of familiarity with our line because they did inspections in the past, so yes. Did they do the one in Capitol? Do you have Go ahead, okay, please. I, I, okay. sure. I can add to that, uh, uh, Commissioner Bertrand. Uh, indeed, yes, in 2005, um, Biggs Cardosa did do inspections of all of the bridges uh, okay. on the Santa Cruz Branch Rail, including the Capitola Bridge. Uh, now, I, I think in meetings that, that we had, uh, we did express that there are some positive aspects of hiring an engineer or an engineering firm that has done already some work on this line and has some familiarity with it. As well, there might be some positive aspects to hiring a different one. Mm -hmm. right. uh, so, I mean, in, in the end, right now we can't tell you which one will get hired. Uh, so the, the next step in the process is that, uh, 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 our, your senior engineer has, has already, uh, you know, requested uh, 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 scopes and um, uh, budgets and uh, cost estimates and so on for the work that's going to be necessary. And based on those that are submitted from, from the from the list of uh, potential engineering firms, then the, the engineering firm that will actually do the work will be selected. So at this point, we don't know exactly which one will be selected. Okay, I appreciate that. Yeah, because we brought up that issue. Mm -hmm. We weren't certain that having someone who's been doing it all along is the best. Um, so I noted from earlier public comment, uh, a letter to this uh, commission, someone who was a structural engineer mentioned that the last study did not address the actual foundations in the creek. And I read that study, the last one, and that's true. It did not address that. It just addressed the, the structure itself. So. Uh, take consideration of that. I think that was a well-placed comment from the public. Mm -hmm. So I'd like to bring that up. I don't know if that person's listening. So my next comment or question is, what's the priority for the inspection in Capitola for that trestle? The priority? Um, yeah, because it's been arrears uh, now since last year, and there should be, as George told us, a certain time frame that, you know, according to statute, you have to keep inspections on a certain time frame, and the RTC has not kept that time frame, so I want to know the priority for the trestle and capital. So the inspections um, are done annually um, as a requirement of FRA, and that's done by the, the operator. And we are doing this, I guess, on, as an extra level of inspection for our own peace of mind to know um, if there's any work needed on our bridges. And so, um, I don't know if you want to add anything yes, to that, Luis? Yeah, I'd like to add to that. Um, so indeed, the Federal Administration does require regular inspections of the, of the bridges. 
and they're, they're called 540-day inspections, so every 540 days inspect, um, uh, full inspection of the bridges are, are, uh, is required, so it's a little over a year but, uh, about that. A and uh, it is the operator that's the one responsible to do those inspections, <coughs> not the RTC. Also, the FRA does not require inspections and bridges that are not being used um, uh, for railroad operations, and as you know, the, the Capitol Bridge and the number of bridges on the rail line have not been used for railroad operations for over a year now. Uh, so, and that's you know, primarily because of the storm damage that, that has occurred. So, uh, that's. So, no, I recognize the line is inoperable, but according to statute, we, we do have that uh, wiggle room. Is that what you're saying? It's the railroad operator, according to statute, that's required to do those inspections. And from what we've been told by DFRA, all the inspections that have been required of them have been done. Uh, like I said, when bridges are not being used uh, for railroad operations, these inspections are not required. Okay, so that's the wiggle room. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, Ms. Kaufman Gomez. Thank you. Uh, this may be more of a financial uh, question. If we're getting about one and a quarter million that's going from Measure D that's going for the, the rail corridor, and this is half a million, where is a funding source for this? Otherwise, we're using half of it just for the maintenance purposes on this particular contract. Where, where are we getting the money on this? Uh, I'm trying to get up to speed. I think somebody mentioned fire hose in terms of getting started here. Mm -hmm. So it would help me know uh, to understand better where the money's actually being coming from for the allocation here. Yeah, the, the funding for the actual uh, work being um, proposed here is, is for Measure D. Um, and you're right, there's more than 500,000 that's being uh, raised per year for Measure D for railroad uh, infrastructure uh, type of work. Uh, some of that the commission has already approved to go towards the Unified Corridor Study because it's, it's doing uh, the, the study that was required <coughs> in the Measure D for, uh, for the analysis of the rail corridor. Um, and uh, Top of my head, I don't remember all the, all the other categories, but that's one of the more significant ones other, other than this. And uh, you had about half a million dollars also going towards the corridor study, so th there's nothing left after the end of the day when it comes to Measure D on the, the corridor? For that first year, you're right, pretty much all, all the funds already, the commission is already uh, approved for, for different things, yes. Okay, thank you. Other questions? Uh, yeah. Johnson, let me, oh, let me get to those who so haven't asked. And, okay. Um, in your response, I forgot. I didn't get the answer to my question. When is the uh, inspection due for the Capitol trestle? So as Louise mentioned, um, I requested scope of work, fee estimate, and schedule from the three um, on-call engineers on the list. Um, and um, I'm supposed to receive their proposals tomorrow. Okay. So I'll have a better idea um, at the next meeting if you'd like an update, but um, but schedule is definitely um, a, a very important factor in the selection. If, if one firm is more available, that's gonna weigh heavily on, um, on their selection because we wanna, you're right, we are late on this and we wanna get these going as soon as we possibly can. So. Okay, no, I, I appreciate um, your awareness that you are late, um, RTC is late. And uh, we do have the concern because people live below the trestle. And as uh, public comment pointed out, there was not an inspection of the actual foundation portions of the trestle, which is pretty important. Um, please communicate the schedule to our mayor in the city of Capitola when that is available, and I'd like to be copied. Sure. Ms. Johnson. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Um, the focus is structural inspection and load rating analysis. So um, that's great. I appreciate your sense of urgency. But didn't the, um, didn't the potential rail operator progressive do inspections on all these and do engineering reports on our bridges? Can you repeat that? I'm sorry. I, 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 can, I, can, I can respond to that if you'd like, Sarah. <laughs> okay. Um, so indeed, the, um, um, one of the proposers for um, rail service on the rail line, Progressive Rail, did hire an inspection firm to uh, go out there and inspect uh, the bridges along the rail line uh, and inspect the, the, the entire rail line. Uh, that inspection is not as, um, as comprehensive 
as what we are proposing to do now. That was more just an observation, uh, you know, going through uh, uh, pretty quickly. Uh, what the, uh, which can, can give the inspectors, you know, a fairly, a fairly good idea of the situation. But to do the load ratings, as uh, Sarah mentioned, you need a more detailed uh, inspection of the structures and actually measuring uh, individual uh, components of a bridge and so on to uh, make sure that uh, you have all the information you need to do those uh, load rating calculations. Um, and then in terms of the, the, the foundation, because it's, it's, it's come up a couple of times, uh, during the last inspections, uh, I mean, that was included uh, also in the inspections. Uh, and what the engineers say, well, well, we'll take a look at the, uh, at the foundation. If we see any need to do a detailed analysis of the foundations, we will do that. But they basically saw no need uh, based on their observations of doing any detailed analysis of the foundations of any of the structures. Uh, because they did talk about the possibility of having to, you know, do some digging uh, to be able to do that or, or uh, hire scuba divers to go in, in the water and, and, and do all of that and so on. Uh, but they said, you know, based on what they saw, that was not necessary for the foundations. So. And just to add one more thing, um, if the operator were to do inspections and they uh, recommended repairs, before we, want, before we would invest funds into the repairs, we, want, we would want to have our own um, inspection done just to confirm and uh, really get a handle on what the repairs needed are. So. so I just want to connect the dots here for myself and for members of the public, and I just want to make sure I understand it correctly. So in the past, um, staff has informed this commission that um, it's our goal as a commission to get our, the entire line up to at least a class one, if we can, a class two rating, so that if and when a rail operator is under contract, this commission can hand over a relatively clean slate, so to speak, to that operator and say, would you please maintain the line on this level and hold them accountable, which I think is a terrific goal, and that makes a lot of sense. So is, that's correct, correct? That's your goal? Yes. That's what yes. you're thinking. Okay, great. So I'm just trying to connect the dots here. And in order to know what kind of repairs are necessary, um, you need to do those calculations, do you not? Whether it's the RTC or a rail operator, you need to know and have a more robust, as you point out, uh, report, an engineering report to know what actually the design of any upgrades and repairs would be. Yes. Right? Okay, Correct. great. Um, so I just, my last question is because of course the only part of the rail line right now that's usable is the three miles down in Watsonville and the rest of it is, hasn't been usable for quite a while because these repairs are necessary and the storm damage. So what is our time frame as a commission to get these repairs done to at least up to the class one level? What would you estimate? Well, that's a really- Loaded question, question, sorry. It really is. Um, <laughs> It, dep it really depends on what this initial effort uh, recommends. So once we get engineers out there and we inspect the bridges and the walls and all the infrastructure out there, we'll have a way better handle on what we have ahead of us. Um, but there's a lot of unknowns right now. So I don't want to give you a schedule and then um, disappoint you later. <laughs> so, what's, so. so I'll ask another question. So uh, that's understood. You can't really understand what construction is going to take because you don't even know what it is. Sure. So for the design, the calculate, the inspections, the design, the calculations, and the suggestions from the engineers, um, do you have an ideal goal as to when they would be done with that level of work? Yeah. Um, I would like to have it done by the end of the summer. It's a okay. lot of work. It's August? 32 bridges. Yeah. September? Uh, yeah. Okay. And then um, the process from that point forward would be to put it, uh, to ask the commission to go out to bid for the construction, get those bids, go under contract. So maybe a few, mo couple months, two or three or whatever, depending on rain and whatever. Okay. And depending on what the improvements would be too. Okay. Yeah. And then lastly, I just, last question, sorry, thank you for your um, patience. Um, how do these engineering reports that we anticipate will be done, how will they relate to what's required by the Surface Transportation Board to actually use the line? I know that there's a requirement for a certain level of engineering report so that we can either ourselves or a rail operator use the line. So how would these reports relate to that requirement? Yeah. Um, this, 
I think you mean the, the Federal Railroad Administration, not the Surface Transportation. Okay, sorry, uh, thank yeah, you. Yeah, the Surface Transportation Board just uh, governs, you know, who, who's who's the operator and okay. and, and so on, et Thanks cetera. Thanks for the correction. But the, but the actual requirements for uh, how operations should be done and what level things sh should be, and so that's the Federal Railroad Administration and that, right. that, that has those requirements. And so, um, 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 yeah, whatever ins inspections need to be done, um, they need to meet the requirements of the Federal Railroad Administration. So that's that's and these would yeah and these would that's one of our basic requirements for the for the uh, 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 consultants are going to be hired that they make sure they inspect them to meet federal right administration requirements and so. just to be clear the prior engineering reports that came out from the progressive inspection did not meet those requirements well, that, that I could not tell you uh, I, I would expect that they would uh, because you all didn't see those reports you haven't seen them I mean, well, yeah the, 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 I mean progressive rail just the, said they did the, them, that, but we don't know what they are. That's the proposed operator. Yeah, they did an inspection to, I think, to get an idea of the condition of the line that they might be taking over. Uh, uh, and they know they have to meet Federal Railroad Administration requirements. I would imagine that was that was part of their analysis, I would expect. But you all didn't see but this. But ha we have not seen those inspections. Okay, before. thanks a lot. Appreciate it. Um, now I'll see if there's members of the public who would like to uh, comment. Gail McNulty, Santa Cruz County Greenway. Um, I am particularly troubled by Ms. Johnson's remarks that have a tone and an assumption that there will be rail on this corridor. Um, in, as a citizen who's hoping for fairness in the Unified Corridor study, um, I know, I'm very aware of the fact that the more time and energy and money that goes into repairing the rail infrastructure, the less likely we are to have a non-rail option. And as you know, we are studying more than one non-rail option in the Unified Corridor study until the end of this year. I would please ask that we table those types of decisions until later. Um, in addition to that, Santa Cruz County Greenway would like to formally ask that RRM Consulting be removed from this list of consultants and discontinued from further consideration by the RTC for um, future projects due to their lack of thoroughness and the poor quality of work in the Monterey Bay Sanctuary Scenic Trail Plan. The significant inaccuracies and omissions in this plan, although we understand it is a conceptual document, are in many ways responsible for the place we've arrived in this conversation. Um, examples, the North Coast part of the plan, the trail they designed and proposed was not even in the Excuse right of way. No, I'd like to uh, let, let, add, let raise her, a point of procedure. This has nothing to do with the item that's before. No, it is. The RRM consulting is one of the plan, she, one of the people being approved. She'll get her three minutes. I, I want to I respect that she gets and, and it is part time. of what we're discussing. They are one of the firms being discussed. Um, segment seven vastly underestimated the cost. We know that phase two, what we've turned into phase two had a major um, retaining wall project that was not included in the plan. And Santa Cruz County Greenway and many other members of the public can tell you that that's going to come up again and again and again. Their cost estimates are nowhere near accurate. Um, RRM ignores environmental damage that will come up. We understand there will be EIRs, but so, you know, at what point are these studies valuable? We spend a lot of money on them. We spend a lot of money and staff time and staff salaries on these studies. And in some ways, they just confuse the conversation more than helping. You know, we, we need to be careful about these studies. And I realize this, at this level, they're only being asked as consultants. We do not agree with the quality of their work. Um, again, looking into ownership, easements, properties, the problems that might come up. This agency needs to be spending our money wisely. We need to be careful about who we hire. We need to be careful about the quality of work. If we've had experiences with them in the past that have led to problems that we're facing right now, let's not work with them again. And let's just be careful about how we spend our money on any studies going forward. Thank you. Thank you. Is there anyone else? Briefly, I, I just want to say thank you for all the hard work you're doing. It's an active rail line. It's got freight customers. It's in two of the four that, that will have passenger and or freight transit on this on this rail line is in two of the four uh, scenarios for the rail corridor and, and it's your responsibility, I, I think you know that, to take care of this asset. Good grief. Um, so thank you. All right. Seeing no one else, I'll bring it back to our Commission for Action. I'd move the staff recommendation. <coughs> 
Motion by Schifrin is Second. seconded by Rockin. Uh, Mr. Johnson. Just uh, very quickly, I think in general I favor anything that, um, in the words of Mr. Scott, uh, benefit this asset that we have. But I just think it's premature right now until the Unified Corridor Study is completed. We've kind of uh, placed a lot of emphasis on that study. And so when other things are brought forward of why we can't do this and why we can't do that, it's always used as a default that we can't act until that study is completed. And so $500,000 going into something that I think is premature, uh, I like the intent, but uh, the timing for me is just off, so I'll be, be voting now. Commissioner Schiffer. Yes, I want to compliment, compliment staff for the work on this issue and for moving forward. I think as staff has mentioned, um, the knowledge about the uh, status of the um, facilities, the infrastructure on the rail line is very important to know irrespective of what happens in the future. It's also very important to know in order to, remo uh, to take care of storm damage. The commission gets blasted for not moving forward on uh, responding to maintenance and, uh, you know, um, deterioration issues, and now it's being criticized for moving forward on those issues. I think staff has done a good job of identifying consultants who will be able to work in the short term and in the long term to deal with the problems that we have now and deal with the problems that we're probably going to have in the future um, based on uh, the uh, nature and its ability to create those kinds of problems. So I, again, I compliment staff for the work that's been done on this, on this issue and I'm glad it's before us. Uh, Ms. Kaufman Gomez and then Mr. Rocket. Thank you. In my understanding here is it's the funds to be set aside in the event that the um, items need to be addressed uh, on the financial side of things and you don't know what you don't know and you need to be able to have access to the funds with this approval in the event that at least the, the, the physical inspection needs to have action regardless of whatever the future of this line is going to be. So we're only at this point with this particular vote is giving you the uh, availability of the use of the funds in the event something's occurred. I know that we'll also be seeing some reports come back as a result of anything that's going to be done here before other further action is going to be taken is my understanding. Half a million dollars isn't going to be enough for us to do any of the repairs, um, but at least keeping the um, inspections going um, is, is practical for us to go ahead and approve for the funding on this. Yeah. Uh, uh, go ahead. Yeah. Uh, the uh, $500,000 you approved today is to actually use those funds for the inspections that are, that are needed and, and other things, not, not just set them aside for... for right, but for in terms of repairs, I mean... Repairs, that's, that's right. Yes. We, we won't... Based on that, that'll come later. Mr. Rockin. <laughs> I guess my fear is if we don't do these inspections and we come forward with recommendations from the Unified Corridor Study that tell us, for example, that one of the rail options is feasible, I would expect to hear from the public that we don't know anything about the state of the rail line and the cost to fix it. <laughs> so if we don't do the study, how would we compare these things fairly or understand whether the recommendation is implementable or not? So that's why I'm going to support the motion. Mr. Bertrand, and then back to Mr. Schiffer. Uh, just a side issue. Um, these trestles and overcrossings are used in many ways right now. So I'd kind of like to get an idea of their condition. And as already pointed out, um, sorry, um, we'd like to know what it's going to be used for later. Can we depend on a good structure right now if we're going to use it for later something else? Mr. Schifrin. Yeah, I'm hesitating a little bit, but I can't uh, let the attack on RRM go forward without responding to it. They've worked uh, for the commission in preparing the plan, the commission, the overall um, rail trail plan, and the commission is ultimately responsible for it. We oversaw the work. We provided the limited budget that made it necessary for it to be a more conceptual plan. I don't know, um, I, most of these sort of general plans that get done don't even have an economic component. They just tell you what they think you should do and then you find out how much it's going to cost afterwards. And so at the level of generality that they were required to work, the fact that there's inaccuracies in their 
uh, and the projections in the plan uh, is uh, not surprising. They were coming up with ballpark estimates. They didn't do detailed engineering studies that are now being done. Um, as those of us with, who um, work with public agencies all the time know, it is not unusual for prices to go up sad but true going from a more general level about a general idea about a project and um, coming down to actually what it's going to cost to do it when you get ready to carry it out. So uh, I mean my sense is they're uh, a responsible competent firm and I the commission has also not only uh, hired them to do the um, the overall rail trail plan, but they are now the EIR consultants on the North Coast, uh, the North Coast rail tr uh, trail component of that plan. And I think it's important for the, to be on the record that they are, um, they, they are, they have and they're continuing to do a very capable job as far as I'm concerned. Okay, well seeing no more comments. Uh, uh, w there was a motion by Schiffer and seconded by Rockin. All in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? No. Mr. Johnson is, is registered as a no vote. Um, next we'll move on to item number 22, which is the final draft 2040 Santa Cruz County Regional Transportation Plan. Ms. Dicar, good morning. Good morning, Commissioners. My item on the agenda today is to discuss the final draft 2040 Santa Cruz County Regional Transportation Plan. The RTC staff works very closely with the Association of Monterey Bay Area Governments, or AMBAG, who is responsible for developing the Metropolitan Transportation Plan Sustainable Community Strategy for the three county region of Santa Cruz County, Monterey, and San Benito. In order to do their work to finalize, um, and our work to finalize the Santa Cruz County Regional Transportation Plan and the uh, AMBAG Region Metropolitan Transportation Plan, Sustainable Community Strategy, and the Associated Environmental Impact Report, the final project list and financial information is required by AMBAG to make the final uh, run of the travel demand model and make the final revisions to these documents. Staff recommendation today for you is to, to provide input and provide the final draft 2040 and to approve the final draft 2040 Santa Cruz County Regional Transportation Plan. There has been input solicited from this commission, the RTC committees, partner agencies, project sponsors, and the public um, has been solicited key milestones during the RTP development process. This includes the policy element, the financial element, and the action element, which defines the financially constrained project list. The last round of outreach efforts began with the release of the draft 2040 uh, Regional Transportation Plan on December 8th. It ended on February 5th, which was a 59-day comment period. Uh, the st our staff st sought input on the draft document from the RTC committees, project sponsors, partner agencies, and resource agencies. Uh, stakeholders, and interested public, and public interest groups were also notified of the release of the draft plan and the public comment period via email distributions and social media. And the public was also notified of the draft plan and the public comment period, um, both online and in printed newspapers, both in North and South County. Uh, input was also thought, sought through from the public from the public hearing that was um, held on January 18th at the RTC meeting, and that was advertised in newspapers countywide as well. Um, the comments received represent a diverse mi mix of interest for transportation in our county, as I'm sure you um, are very aware of. Um, and the 2040 RTP uh, does provide a balance of projects for the diversity of interest in Santa Cruz County. The uh, main areas that we revised from the draft to this final draft were uh, changes to the revenues that are based on the more recent Senate Bill um, 1 revenue estimates. Senate Bill 1 estimates are currently estimated to provide approximately $24.5 million per year to Santa Cruz County. This includes the shop funds that go directly to Caltrans, but they are um, for Santa Cruz County. There were changes to the project list based on these revision, based on revisions from project sponsors that included removing projects that have already been completed, updating costs and project descriptions to reflect more recent information. The project costs and descriptions in the project list were also updated based on the projects that this commission recently proposed for funding from the California Transportation Commission. 
And the um, third major revision was the definition of transportation disadvantaged communities was revised in order to incorporate the definition from Assembly Bill 1550 that defines low income individuals a little differently from the AMBAG definition. We previously um, followed the AMBAG definition of transportation disadvantaged communities, but wanted to also include this other definition from Assembly Bill 1550. The reason for this is when project sponsors in our community apply for grant funding for transportation projects, funding agencies may evaluate projects based on the ability to provide for transportation disadvantaged communities. And so this will be helpful for project sponsors um, if this definition is specified in our regional transportation plan. So once again, AMBAG will be using the final draft constrained project list to develop the final environmental impact report and to run the, the travel demand model on the final project list. So your input today on any changes to the regional transportation plan will be incorporated into this work. Um, and just a little more detail on the environmental impact report. AMBAG is the lead agency for the environmental impact report that serves the Metropolitan Transportation Plan, Sustainable Community Strategy, as well as the Regional Transportation Plans of Santa Cruz County, Monterey, and San Benito. AMBAG released this draft EIR on December 4th and received comments um, during the comment period that ended on February 5th. It was greater than a 60-day comment period. Uh, the, a public hearing was held in Santa Cruz County on January 30th to receive comments on the draft environmental impact report. And the final EIR will include responses to comments received. AMBAG is scheduled to certify the environmental impact report on June 13th. Um, once that occurs, the RTC will consider adoption of the EIR findings in June 2018, along with um, adoption of uh, this regional transportation plan. With that, um, my staff recommendation is that the RTC provide input and approve the final draft 2040 Santa Cruz County Regional Transportation Plan. Happy to take any questions or comments. Thank, Thank you, you for the presentation. Are there questions? Uh, Commissioner Schifrin. Are we really approving a plan here? I mean, I, I, given that it has to go to AMBAG, the EIR has to be certified, and the, you know, then it's gonna come back to us. Aren't we really just accepting it and making changes to it? I'm a little concerned about the word okay. approval because that implies a final action. And this really, as I understand what you're just saying, this isn't really a final action. This is to say this is as far as we're concerned what we'd like the plan to say, uh, but we're not going to be able to adopt it until the final EIR is out and it's that EIR has been reviewed and certified then the final adoption. So changes could be made based on what's in that um, document. Is that not correct? That's correct. Thank you for pointing that out, Commissioner Schifrin, and um, perhaps we need to change what the recommendation is to have an acceptance. This is for the final draft. This is not the final. The final will occur in June 2018. Thank, Thank you. you. I'll be looking for the appropriate motion at the, uh, at the, <laughs> at the, the time. Other questions that people have about uh, this to Ms. Dykar? Um, I, I just had uh, one question. Um, I, I'm glad that we updated this. We have the SB1 numbers here. Um, it does get us closer to our, our actual need, you know, which you, you estimate at $7 billion through 2040. This is about, gets us halfway there. Um, the uh, SB1 is potentially threatened. And uh, how much would we lose uh, if we, uh, if SB1 were to go away? I cannot say I'm an expert on that. Uh, Rachel Morricone is really the one that's been tracking that and she is not here today, but I know that I, I did add up the in our financial estimates for any SB1 funds, it's 24.5 million to our county every year from those fundings. And well, that's, I was, you know, $25 million a year. Uh, 20 uh, you, <laughs> that's, that's what they call real money. Uh, uh, so uh, you did remember the numbers. That, that's what you were gonna uh, share with her. You don't have to use your phone a friend then. So, um, yeah, well, I, I just w I want to point that out that $25 million will uh, be for great projects here. It supports not only our roadway, our bicycle system, and our bus system. Um, and people will have a chance to say whether they want to make those investments or not. Uh, it's, it's, it's a wise use of gas tax revenue to, to support our transportation infrastructure. So uh, th uh, thank you for the work on this report. Uh, let's see if there are members of the public who would like to provide testimony uh, to us about the 2040 RTP. 
Regional Transportation Plan. Good morning. Good morning once again. Um, just want to get through this really quickly, a lot here. Um, it's quite apparent a lot of work went into this document, uh, Michael Saint, by the way, uh, and very well done by Ginger and the staff. Really appreciate it. Um, I'd like to touch on just a few areas of the section one in the 2040 RTP. Um, under uh, congestion, which is page 1-6, it states the region must find ways to operate and utilize existing highway and transit networks more efficiently and sustainably over the long term. Uh, I looked up the division uh, definition of efficiency. It's achieving maximum productivity with minimum wasted effort or expense. Uh, efficiency to me under that definition would be to basically move more people and not single occupancy vehicles. Uh, number two, under environmental and public health, page 1-7, uh, it states to help lower greenhouse gas emissions it lists improvements in vehicle technology, uh, creating greater fuel efficiency. Uh, well, most of this, uh, these newer tax cars will be financially out of the reach of our, most of our drivers in this county and other counties. Uh, also, our amount of time we keep cars uh, has increased 40% since 2006. Cars on roads over 12, or basically over 12 years old continue to grow and is it suggested that it will increase 15% by 2020. Uh, so instead of having more efficient vehicles, we're gonna have less efficient vehicles. Basic reason for this is the cost of technology and um, not enough money to go out and buy a new car. Uh, number three, under energy, page 110, it states major energy consuming nations uh, announced new measures for improving energy efficiencies in the automobile including the fuel economy of the U.S. Well, if anybody's been listening to the news, um, that will so soon change due to our EPA Scott Pruitt's announcement on April 2nd, 2018, to roll back our miles per gallon goal set by the Obama administration. Effective, those will be effective in 2022. Just about the same time we'll either be working on or starting to widen a freeway. Uh, all efforts need to go to focus on congestion relief and lowering greenhouse gas emissions, now made more difficult by the Trump administration and more older cars on the highways. I say we focus us on mass transit. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning. Good morning, Gail McNulty, Greenway, and I would like to echo Mr. Sain's commendation of, of staff for their work on this plan. It is. It's an important plan, you know, we really do need to um, give our community, empower our community to act locally. And if Mr. Um, Nelson were here, he would remind us how important our transportation picture is in terms of the climate. Um, I would like to read a quote from Appendix F of the plan. Unfortunately, even with this recent infusion of funding, there are considerable challenges associated with operating, maintaining, and investing in the future transportation system. Projected revenues still only generate about half of what would be needed to fund all of the projects that have been identified through 2040. So just a reminder, it's super important to be thinking about this and to be looking at this. Another level of this conversation is focusing in on what we can actually do. We need to think about the money we have. I know all of you in the county and in your various municipalities are facing budget shortfalls. We know this. We know that we have a lot of things that we need to fund that we don't know how we're going to do it. And as we think about transportation, we need to remember the people that are stuck in gridlock on the highway every day. And we need to be thinking about realistic things. They may be small. Think minimal. Think what we can actually achieve with the money we expect to have in hand. And let's focus on achievable solutions. Thank you. Thank you. Is there anyone else? Good morning. Uh, Barry Scott, Aptos. Uh, just, just a couple of things. The, um, I, I want to remind the uh, commission and anyone listening that uh, the uh, Capitola crossing at, uh, in March 15th at the TPW meeting, uh, the potential for rebuilding or, 
or modifying that bridge using uh, Measure D funds to leverage other funds uh, was described, a way to keep that trestle or replace that trestle but integrate uh, the, the, uh, the bike and pedestrian path. And that we find that uh, an amazing uh, opportunity. Um, and the other thing I wanna, wanna, wanna point out, because uh, opponents to rail transit often talk about the high cost and we can't afford it and so forth. And, and again, there's 136.8 billion described by tra Caltrans over the next 22 years in the state rail plan. And if that's not defeated, that's a huge amount of money. We did the math, the population weighted proportion of that is some $748 million over 22 years. And, and while funds aren't dispersed based on population, that is the chunk of change in a dedicated rail pot of money that we'll be putting into. Now, if we don't spend it, guess what? That money still goes in there from our pockets and it gets spent by those counties that do apply for it. So it comes up often, is there money for a train? And, and I always point to the Caltrans, Caltrans State Rail Fund, our population weighted share, and the fact that if we don't spend it, someone else will. Thanks. Thank you. Seeing no one else, I'll bring it back to our Commission for Action. Commissioner Schifrin. I move the staff recommendation with the change in the uh, word approved to accept, and so that the commission uh, would, recommend, uh, would review and, and accept the final draft 2040 Santa Cruz County Regional Transportation Plan. Uh, motion by Schifrin, seconded, seconded by Rockin, and I just want to make sure uh, th that it's clear what the motion is. Uh, uh, Commissioner Rockin. And Captain. <laughs> I want to commend staff on this piece of work. I, I spent three hours reading this last night. I'm a speed reader. I read stuff really quickly. It took me three hours to take, but you, know, you can't speed through some of it. You have to look at the numbers and take time to think about what they imply and what's going on. It, it, the fact that we have an idea of where half of our money would come from, an idea, it's not, it may, be, may not work out, but that it's not just a guess or a wild notion is amazing. I mean, when the city of Santa Cruz looks at our wish list of things that we need to have, we need to have done that are desperately you know, causing us problems, we have about 10% of our wish list funded. <laughs> this is 50% potentially, you know, the, you know, reasonable ex uh, estimate of where the funding could come from. I, I think that's actually quite impressive. And there's no way to know what in the next, you know, between now and 2040, what additional sources of funding will happen. God, we, I, I'll speak for myself. I hope we have a different federal administration that actually cares about public transit, that can make a big difference, I would think. Um, instead of cutting the funding, they actually might increase it. We start to think about people waking up and thinking about rational ideas about what's important to us and how important transportation is. I would assume that the, the uh, climate change issue will become more and more real to more and more people who will start to think we ought to actually spend money to do something about it rather than just ignore it or feel bad about it or something. So I, I think this is a very optimistic plan, actually, and I was quite impressed with the work that went into it. And it, again, it's very difficult to project what you're gonna do at, between now and 2040, but I think the plan does a really good job, and I thought it was incredibly educational to me, and I'm well, well educated about this issue in the county. I've been, I was in public office for 26 years. I have a, you know, been involved longer than that. So I really wanna thank our staff for this work and the people that, anybody that put work into it. it, it it's quite an impressive plan. And I've read many plans before that sort of just vaguely look all right and stuff and you read through them and you kinda of go, well, but what does it really say? Does it give us any direction? This thing gives us a lot of very clear direction about where we need to be moving and what, what kinds of things need to change and so forth. So I, I just found it very practical, very useful, and, and uh, uh, for me, educational, but I think it's a really good, as good as you can do as far as getting towards what you're gonna do, you know, again, between now and 2040, you, you can't get more concrete than this and, and not expect to be off wildly or something. So I thought it was an excellent job and I wanna commend staff for it. Just want to acknowledge Rachel Morricone of our staff. She's not here today, but she is the um, brain power behind the financial information and she worked very closely with AMBAG. AMBAG was also very much involved with the financial estimate information. Well, uh, this uh, commission um, made uh, some big changes back in 2014 as to how we look at our regional transportation plan. And so these kind of updates actually help sharpen 
uh, that, that work, which is, uh, was the first time looking at sustainability, which was uh, uh, trying to figure out uh, ways that we could measure our success, um, that uh, through that work, it laid the groundwork for a successful uh, 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 a sales tax campaign, which provides, uh, according to this document, about $20 million a year. Um, we were able to, we'll be able to leverage that with the $25 million a year that we're getting uh, from the state to really make a difference in the transportation infrastructure in our county and the plans that we have for how to move people around. So uh, I, I want to offer also my appreciation uh, to the work of the staff now, the staff in the past, and the commission who saw the vision in trying to create a document that was actually um, uh, a lot more significant than, uh, than our, our past regional transportation plans. Ms. Kaufman Gomez. Yes, um, I'm probably coming from way over on the other end when it comes to taking a look at this um, right out the chute for my first uh, meeting here. I think it's quite an intense project for me to try and grasp as much of this information as possible. However, just as we are with our, our households, there's a wish list, there's a bucket list, there's always things that are endlessly that need to have done. This provides a, a nice layout of and what we anticipate that this county needs in the, the different modalities of transportation. And it takes a lot of forethought on that, a lot of the different agencies, a lot of experiences to come together, formulate this and put it in something that hopefully does not sit on a shelf in dust. Um, I think that that's what's really significant about this is we, we need to keep this as a refresher on, on top of our desks to go back and look at this and see how we're achieving some of these goals. Um, and, I, and I do feel that the whole, um, when it comes to the um, th the water issues that we're going to be having in the future, I know that that will be maybe another layer that comes into here in, in terms of a, a chapter of of what what's going on here with um, our shorelines and and things like that um, that will affect our, our transportation modes. Um, so it's a very good document to have. Um, I can't say that I'm fluent completely with this. It'll still take me some more time to digest through this material, but it's a very good piece of work that I will be continuing to uh, to go back and relay on. Thank you. Okay, so there's a motion by Schifrin, seconded by Rockin. Um, all in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries unanimously. Thank you. Thank you for your work. Uh, next we'll move on to item number 23, which is fiscal year 2018-19 proposed budget. Mr. Mendez. Yeah. Yes, good morning, commissioners. As you know, at the beginning of each calendar year, staff does prepare a, a budget um, for the upcoming uh, fiscal year of, the, of this agency, and we work with the Budget Administration Personnel Committee on that and present it to, to them. The Budget Administration Personnel Committee did take a look at the proposed fiscal year 1819 uh, budget at their March 9th meeting and does recommend your approval. Um, the committee also expressed some concerns with the RTC reserves. Uh, and uh, also the, uh, the fact that we don't have complete congestion data for Highway 17. We made some recommendations regarding that. As you know, one of the m main sources of, of revenue for trans transportation in Santa Cruz County is TDA, is TDA. That's been the case for, for many years. Uh, fortunately now, we also have Measure D. Uh, which helps helps a lot, uh, the overall picture for transportation in the county, and SB1, which was uh, passed by the state. Uh, unfortunately, the federal government has not um, you know, resolved the issues with the insolvency of the Highway Trust Fund, and they don't seem to really uh, be able to do anything with regards to improving transportation uh, funding. Uh, furthermore, there are efforts to try to repeal the, uh, SB1 through a statewide proposition in November 2018, which you know, could change things uh, uh, drastically. Uh, but the fact that you know, Measure D is in place and that SB1 uh, got approved definitely allows uh, this agency to help the, the county uh, more fully meet the transportation needs of this community and this uh, budget uh, does reflect that. Uh, and for the Transportation Development Act uh, portion every year, uh, this staff does get estimates from the auditor controller, county auditor controller, in terms of what's going to be um, available for the following fiscal year. Uh, and their estimate for fiscal year 1819 is uh, about 4.6% 4, 4 above what their estimate was for fiscal year 1718. And as a result, all the distributions to all the recipients of those revenues uh, go up by about 4.5% uh, after taking into account. Uh, uh, the need to put some money into the TDA reserve to meet 
the uh, uh, RTC established goal of 8% for those uh, uh, TDA reserves. Uh, now the uh, amounts, uh, the increases for the cities and the county are not quite exactly the, uh, the same as everyone else because we also do update the population figures uh, that the distribution is based on. So those, those will vary slightly. Um, now, I will not go through everything uh, in the budget, um, but I will just uh, highlight a couple of things. Uh, one of those is the Free Service Patrol uh, program. We are uh, very, uh, uh, very lucky that uh, SB1 also included Free Service Patrol and pretty much doubled the amount of state funds for the Free Service Patrol program. So the RTC will be getting more, uh, more funding for that. Uh, it, it won't all be distributed according to the established statewide formula for, for FSP. So the new funds, 50, about 50% 50 of that will be using that formula. Uh, some of it will go to the CHP for their support of FSP services, and then so, uh, some of it will be distributed by com competition. So the RTC will also uh, uh, work with Caltrans to see what sort of uh, you know, additional um, FSP service we can implement that will compete well for some of those uh, competition funds. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, the uh, Budget Administration Personnel Committee did express some concern over the fact that we don't have complete uh, congestion information for Highway 17, which is one of the variables that impacts the amount of money the RTC gets for the Future Service Patrol program. We have uh, worked with Caltrans in the past, and the committee did uh, recommend that the RTC direct staff uh, to uh, communicate with Caltrans and get information on how do, that we can improve that situation to have better congestion uh, data for Highway 17. So we've already communicated uh, uh, with Caltrans regarding that. Um, as you know, the Highway 1 uh, Corridor Improvement Project continues at this environmental document, and the plan is to complete that tiered environmental document by the end of uh, this calendar year. Uh, at that time, then we will be able to move into the design phase of the next auxiliary lanes project, where the, which are the auxiliary lanes from 41st Avenue to Soquel Drive with a bicycle pedestrian over crossing at, at Chanticleer. So those funds that the RTC programmed in the past for that design work now are in, incorporated into uh, this budget. Um, uh, and then of course, uh, we have the Measure D uh, funds incorporated into the budget. We did up Date the uh, uh, some of the uh, numbers for the 30-year uh, projections uh, for Measure D. The, the underlying um, rationale and assumptions are still the same, but what, what we did is included the actual revenues that were received by the Regional Transportation Commission in 2016-17, which was actually only one month of, uh, of payment, which uh, we didn't know whether that would be the case or not, uh, but that happened, so that uh, we did uh, include that, uh, and also. Uh, did update the underlying uh, information that determines the distribution to the cities and, and the county for the uh, neighborhood portion of the funds. As, as you know, the Measure D formula includes uh, three variables for that. They include population, they include uh, lane miles of roadway, and also site where uh, uh, the uh, Measure D tax is, is generated. Uh, and so that information was updated to what's the latest uh, information available for those for those variables, and so that varied the distribution slide not not significantly, but it you know and that's to be expected just as it happens with the TDA revenues when we update the population figures that that those uh, distributions vary slightly, but not terribly uh, significantly. In terms of staff resources, there's no change, uh, no additional staffing is being proposed uh, in this budget, um, and also for the. Uh, RTC reserves, as I uh, uh, mentioned earlier, there was, a, there was a concern of the Budget Administration Personnel Committee that perhaps the 30% the um, that the RTC uh, uh, determined should be uh, the RTC reserves, 30% of the operating uh, portion of the RTC should be you know, what the reserve uh, you know, uh, would be for the, for the RTC. And, and the RTC has been working to get to that goal, and we haven't yet uh, uh, gotten to that goal. Currently, it's uh, at about 25.3% with this uh, proposed budget. Uh, but the B Budget and Fishing Personnel Committee did uh, recommend that the RTC direct staff uh, that there be a study of the RTC reserves done to see whether that's an adequate level of reserves for the RTC or not. 
And so those, those recommendations are, are here for your consideration. So we do, do recommend, and the Budget and Personnel Committee does recommend that you approve this budget as presented uh, to you here, and also direct staff to work with uh, Caltrans on the congestion uh, information for Highway 17, and also do a study of the RTC uh, reserve target to make sure that's adequate for the RTC needs. Okay, thank you for the report. Are there questions? Uh, Ms. Kaufman Gomez. Sorry, thank you. Um, you have an increase of about 2.4 on the revenue projected over time, but are you doing anything in terms of any economical trends um, that may occur in terms of our economy itself? I mean, I don't think that our trajectory of all of our economy is going to be 2.4 from here on out. Um, are you trying to do an overall blended average for that, for what you're doing here? But, you know, obviously, we hopefully we don't have another 08 happen, but mm -hmm. um, your budget is not looking like there's going to be any change except for just a sto slow, steady growth. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, I think you're referring probably to the uh, Measure D. 22.4 uh, uh, on that page. 22.4, so 2.4, oh, that's uh, actually part of the previous item. Okay. Uh, that's the, R the RTP, I think that's the... Uh, I'm, t I'm trying to get my numbers <laughs> lined up here with the way the agenda is, but um, it, it's... Th that was one of the concerns or, that I, I showed here on my, on my notes. Um, okay. And the other is 25% uh, of what is the, that you, uh, you said so 30% is what your goal is of the operating and you've got 25% uh, this year allocating. What is the, the total figure that we're looking at here that you're, for your 30% operating reserves? Yeah, it's, uh, it's what's the, the operating portion of, of the RTC, which ends up being a, a little over $3 million or so, so that I remember off the, off the top of my head. So, thank you. You're welcome. Other questions? Uh, then I'll open it up, see if there's any comments from the public. Good morning. Good morning. Um, again, staff, thank you for your um, work on this. We recognize that it's not an easy project balancing these numbers. Um, and I would just like to add one more echo of that, the just reminder of the general climate and thank you um, to Commissioner Gomez for pointing out that we don't know what our future economy will look like. And also just in terms of a lens, when we look at any of these things, just please think in terms of what we can accomplish in the short term for the people who are currently suffering? What changes can we make? Measure D, I'm glad that we finally have, I'm glad that we have put into place the, or we are working on forming an, a, a, an oversight committee. Um, I, I wish as a citizen that that committee um, would have some input on expenditures prior. You want to stick to the budget. I, I, I will be done, but, uh, but again, just if we could look at everything in that lens, um, what's realistic, what's doable, what's achievable, thank you. Is there anyone else? Uh, I would say that a, a budget is a reflection of what you think is doable and achievable. That's what we were actually put down this year is what we think we can do and what we have money for. So uh, that's what we're voting on uh, for our proposed budget is what we think we can achieve with the money we have. Uh, Mr. Rock. I'm gonna move that we uh, approve the recommendations from staff. Um, and which includes uh, adopting the uh, resolution that uh, supports this budget, directing staff to initiate a study of RTC reserves, and direct staff to request information from Caltrans on how to improve congestion data for Highway 17. I'll wait for a second to make a comment. I'll second the motion. Uh, motion by Rock and second by Kaufman. Goldman. So my, my comment is I, I look at these budgets of the RTC with a concern for years now, both when I've been on it and when not, um, that. The RTC is not basically uh, taking money from the bus system, from transit, and moving it into other projects, which might be exciting, you know, small little projects, little one here, little one there, but that ultimately don't move as many people around as the bus system actually does. And this budget doesn't do that. This budget ac actually is, uh, if anything, improves the situation of the transit district and its funding. Um, and to the. Uh, I'm particularly appreciative of the reserve policy that we have here. I mean, if SB1 gets put, taken back by the voters, which one hopes doesn't happen but could happen, you need reserves. I mean, otherwise you face an instant you'll fall off a cliff and a crash and stuff. So the idea for our for things that we operate as the RTC to have some backup so that we don't have to, like, we have a little time to figure out what can we do to fix it or recover it or, like, decide the hard decisions about what we're not going to fund. 
uh, in, in future years, I, I think it's critical. So I think I appreciate the reserve policy we have here, and I think that um, it's a, at this point, the, uh, the idea of studying them a little further to be clear about how quickly we should move instantly to the amount or whether what we have now is sufficient is worth doing. Um, but, I, but I think we're in the right ballpark here, and a lot of times people are concerned that you're taking money you should be spending right now and putting it in reserves. It, it, I think you have to be fiscally responsible, and I think the agency's doing that. Just very briefly, I just want to say that the budget was worked over by the Budget Administration Personnel Committee and comes with their, our full uh, support and recommendation. Uh, Mr. Bertrand. Um, as Rockin said, with SB1, uh, that is a scary thing in terms of the reserves, um, but also the scary thing is our winners. Um, the last one was horrible. And who knows how much more we're going to be able to sustain in this county. S seeing no one else, uh, I'll, uh, there was a motion by uh, Rockin, seconded by Kaufman Gomez. All in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries unanimously. And so now we move to review of items to be discussed in closed session. Did you want to say something, Mr. Yes, uh, uh, Commissioners. There are two items uh, for you to consider during, uh, during closed session uh, this morning. Uh, one is regarding uh, labor negotiations with your uh, uh, bargaining uh, unions that represent uh, your, uh, all the employees of the RTC, and also uh, an item for a conference of real proper negotiators regarding the Santa Cruz branch rail line. Do we expect any reports out from uh, this closed session? I do not expect that. No. Okay. So this will be a time, if you've been waiting to talk about something that is on our closed session agenda, to come share it with us. Hello again, Gail McNulty. Um, I would just like to, I did get this letter to everybody, but I'm afraid it didn't get to you until two o'clock yesterday. So in case anyone missed it, I would like to take an opportunity um, to read a letter that I sent to the commissioners, to the Watsonville City Council, and to some of our members of the local press yesterday with just a new development on what community members are learning about Progressive Rail. Um, the evidence that Progressive Rail is a profiteering company that puts their business interests above the well-being of the communities in which they they operate continues to mount. Please protect our county and bring an end to negotiations with this company. Tomorrow, or actually today, um, in Wisconsin, the Office of Railroad Commissioner will take public comment on Progressive Rail's petition to advance their interest by closing 95th Avenue in the town of Eagle Point, Wisconsin. The community is concerned that the closing of this avenue will increase local traffic and take away a needed emergency route. Progressive Rail plans to assemble a 140-car un 140 unit trains of silica sand for distribution to the hydro hydraulic fracturing companies. The unit train is um, a type of commodity um, which increases um, it, it maximizes profits for the company. Um, however, they require extra long lines of track that railroads often use preemption and eminent domain to build. In 2015, Progressive Rail attempted to solve this um, unicar plan by taking agricultural land and transforming it, rezoning it into heavy industrial. They caught um, they cut some flux from the farmers, and that plan has been put on hold. This is an attempt to do something different. Um, in contrary to Craig McKenzie's statements in the letter that he wrote in January to the Watsonville City Council, Greenway's concern is not with the proposed, or not only, much larger than the proposed propane distribution terminal in Watsonville. We're concerned about Progressive Rail's track record in other communities and the motives that they have for establishing railroad operations in Santa Cruz County. Those of you that visited the communities where they do business, um, sure, you spoke to economic development folks, and absolutely, Progressive Rail does know how to make money. They, they, we can basically divide our short lane rail operators into two categories right now. Those like Iowa Pacific who are failing and those who have figured out a way to latch onto the oil and gas industry. Progressive Rail fits in the latter. Um, is that something we want for our county where we've worked so hard to combat offshore drilling, where we've worked so hard on clean energy, where we've done many other things to, that are in line with our community values? 
I don't think so. And many other people in this community don't think so either. This is a growing conversation and I will let you know that any choices you made will be weighed in the aftermath. And it, this is, this is not a company that is in line with our community and more and more people are realizing this. The conversation is growing, not lessening. Thank you. Thank you. Is there anyone else who'd like to comment on the closed session items? Please come forward. Now's your chance. Good afternoon. My name's Mark Lee. I'm from District 5 in North County. Uh, I just want to uh, quickly support the comments uh, of the last speaker. Thank you. Thank you. We appreciate your brevity. <laughs> I'll try to match that. Um, I, tr I, I trust the, 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 your staff who are professionals in this matter, and I hope that you won't, uh, won't be afraid of the, the rail line and, and understand there's the crude's not being shipped anywhere around here, and it, the, the crude's not, you know, you need a refinery somewhere nearby. It, it, it's just a scare tactic, and I'm, I'm just so sad to see the, sorry, the, the fear mongering that's used uh, by the groups that would, that would have us say no to the potential for a modern, clean, good grief, electric transit. So uh, take what you hear uh, with a grain of salt, and I, I know you'll make the right decision with the, the rail carrier. It's a temporary rail carrier to keep us in compliance and to serve our freight passenger, uh, freight customers. It's not the big deal that it's made out to be. Thank you. Thank you. Please come forward. Okay, I'll be brief too. Uh, thanks again for your, doing your due diligence and personally going and visiting uh, states and communities that Progressive Rail serves. Thank you for looking at actual facts and not just rhetoric. Um, and Barry's point that it's a temporary rail operator would make it really not worth Progressive's money to come in and try to do all this stuff because they're gonna be gone eventually anyway. So, thank you. Thank you. Good morning. Hi, I'm Michael Kane. I just wanted to uh, state my opposition to Progressive. Um, my opposition is actually to rail in general and even the notion that if we have enough money, I mean, it's all about if there's money, we should grab onto it and build a railroad. I think that the trail itself could be much better served by active transportation. I go down to Monterey all the time to ride on that trail. I was down there this weekend. There were thousands of happy people biking up and down the trail. And uh, I think that having a railroad alongside this such a narrow space uh, really makes it railroad or trail. I don't see the two of them coexisting together. And I also wanted to say that I think Progressive feels very much like a Trojan horse in terms of operating a tourist train, which has proven to be unsuccessful in the past. And uh, the, the, uh, the preemptive right that, that they bring with them really scares the hell out of me. So that's it. Thank you. Is there anyone else who'd like to address us? <coughs> Seeing none, uh, we will adjourn to closed session. Um, we may be having a, uh, uh, a uh, TPW, we de definitely will be having a TPW meeting yes. on April 19th. Yes. So please keep it on your calendar. In Scotts Valley. In Scotts Valley, no less. In Scotts Valley. Yes. All right. See you all then.